Hello, welcome to what I'm calling Bite Size Kierkegaard. Uh, this is the start of what will hopefully become a series of videos as I work my way through Soren Kierkegaard's philosophical works uh, and anything else that is interesting uh, that I come along on the way. So this series of, of videos is primarily for myself. It's an output um, that I hope to, you know, I hope to be productive in this reading. Um, but yeah, who is Kierkegaard? So who is this guy? There's other videos you can find that, that do a better job and other uh, summaries, but I'll just sum up in a, in a brief way. Uh, Kierkegaard, um, in Danish, his name sounds more like Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard? Kierkegaard. I'm going to mispronounce lots of things here. Um, get used to it here. Um, he's a Danish philosopher from the 1800s, contemporary of Hans Christian Andersen. Um, kind of an acquaintance, though he wasn't like a friend with him. Uh, he lived in Copenhagen most of his life. Uh, he did journey out to Berlin uh, briefly when he was younger and also to northern Denmark when he was younger again. Um, but most of his life was centered in the world of Copenhagen. Um, he is kind of considered the first existentialist, um, but he's a Christian existentialist, which is a bit different than the later existentialists that followed. Um, a lot of his life is, is uh, shaped by his broken engagement with Regine Olson. Uh, so he kind, of, he, he kind of thought that he could only pursue you know, marriage or his authorship, one or the other, but not both. And so he obviously chose this, this authorship. And uh, in his relatively short life, uh, he actually produced lots of books. Those were his children in a way. Um, as I said before, he, has a, he, he died early. He was only 42, uh, and he was a good-looking guy early on, but like if you see drawings later on, he, he looked like he had aged prematurely, so it's kind of a rough life and kind of sickly. He had some issues, uh, but like ridiculously uh, smart and talented. Uh, he's considered a genius in his own time, and obviously after we're still reading about him, reading his books. Um, but yeah, he, he did have some issues. He had like this melancholia, um, uh, kind of typical existentialist, if you will. Um, but yeah, he did have sort of his way of coping with that was kind of a uh, graphomania it's called just like endless writing. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll definitely see that <laughs> this is me working my way through that graphomania. Uh, but there's some interesting themes throughout his works. Um, too many to list, obviously, but just to get a sense of what he's about. Um, inwardness, authenticity, subjective truth, and faith. Um, these are all overloaded terms, especially that subjective truth is very misinterpreted. Um, but um, I'm going to read a quote that will give, that will shine a light on exactly what the meaning of that is. I'll, I'll read that in a bit. But yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that, that the motivation behind this series of videos is a motivation for me to read through this. Uh, so these videos are primarily for me. If you get something out of them, great. Um, but I am not an expert. I will get things wrong. Um, I will mispronounce things as I already have. Uh, this series is about what I find interesting, what I'm getting out of this, what I'm highlighting, what I'm underlining. When you read through these for your, yourself, like you're going to get some something different. Uh, and I think from Kierkegaard's point of view, that, that would be fine. It's more of like an artistic perspective where the artist puts something out there. Uh, it, it may resonate differently with other people. I think that's totally fine. I think, I think that is sort of in the spirit of Kierkegaard. Um, but yeah, why, are, why am I even interested in this old guy? You know, like, you know, why am I not interested in more contemporary philosophers? Um, for, for a few reasons, uh, he's an interesting character. I've studied Kierkegaard since I was in college, so I do have a philosophy major, if it counts for anything. Uh, I did do some research then. I, you know, as one of the assignments, I read through uh, concluding unscientific postscript and totally did not understand maybe 90% of what I was reading. Read it again recently, and I'm like, okay, I, I get it this time. Um, so like, that's another reason to go through these, to be, get something different, you know, every time as you age and as you change, you read books, reread books, 
Uh, and it's going to resonate differently as it resonates differently with other people. You know, just your future self is different than your past self. Now, that's kind of interesting. But as I was saying before, the relevance for today is actually astounding. There's a lot of things that were true in Kierkegaard's time that are, that are also very true of this time uh, in a sad way um, yeah, about our relation, the relation of individuals to our society. Uh, and what problems that could bring, uh, and also some interesting things about our relationship to God, um, and what is the nature of faith, um, and then what does it mean, you know, to be a Christian? Um, you know, this, Kierkegaard was speaking at a time when you know most everyone was going to church, um, and uh, it's it's kind of became like a routine thing. Uh, there is a quote where he says basically it's like Christianity of his time became like a you know citizenship it's something that's accidental you get born into christendom so christendom is different than what christianity true christianity is and so we'll see that um there's a lot of these like one versus the other um you know subjective versus objective truth and we'll see a lot of these sort of dichotomy dichotomies and i think that is really influenced by hegel he's reacting against hegel where these dichotomies you know the synthesis or rather the thesis antithesis create the synth the new synthesis and then it kind of the new synthesis reacts against the new antithesis and it, it's like an endless cycle um to a certain degree uh well everyone in Kierkegaard's time is influenced by hegel he's the predominant figure of the time he's reacting against that but using that those sort of hegelian terms uh, we'll see that in the first book that i'm going to read through that uh, actually hans christian anderson thinks of Kierkegaard as a hegelian and Kierkegaard is kind of annoyed at that which is kind of funny. Um, yeah, Hans Christian Andersen writes him into a play as a Hegelian, which is kind of <laughs> it's kind of funny. So, um, but yeah, th there is enormous relevance for today, uh, especially in you know our relation to society and sort of um, you know you go on Facebook and you see what your friends are doing. You see your friends are buying houses and having families and having kids and. Um, getting richer and successful in their careers and it's sort of like stepping back from that and thinking like really is that is that what it's about you know is that is that life you know like is that is that is that cool or is like maybe life is something that we're missing here like maybe it's not just keeping up with the joneses so uh, and i think this is particularly from Kierkegaard's perspective because he's a single person uh it, I think, uh, you know, as, as someone who is also single, the, coming from this, this different perspective, it's kind of us versus society. Like we're a little bit of outcast from society, although we are still in with it. You know, Kierkegaard, you know, took daily walks throughout the city and chatted with people. He was very social, but very single and very individual and had very private faith. Uh, so we'll hear about those themes like private versus public uh, and how those two might be very different. Someone might be, you know, they appear to be very successful, but inwardly they're very, you know, depressed or, you know, and this, this is something that rings true today. Like people appear successful and then you hear about them the next day in the news and it turns out they've committed suicide. It's like, what? Like this person had everything. They're rich. Like, what's the problem? You know, like uh, these are recurring. Th this is a human condition. You know, we have to deal with this. So I think it's highly relevant for today. Um, but because of the enormous output of, of Kierkegaard's works, for better or worse, like very wordy, uh, I, my intention is to make this bite size. So I want to make these these videos as short as possible. Already, I've already gone almost 10 minutes, unfortunately. But um, I'm going to leave you with one quote before I go. Um, oh, I just want to give a little preview of uh, maybe some extra material as, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to be going through the Hong translation. So the first one we'll go through is this book, the early polemical works. And um, occasionally we might be delving into Kierkegaard's journals and notebooks, which I'm actually going to read a quote from. I don't have all of these. Um, let's see. But yeah, also we have some other source material, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, this is just stuff where it's like, I have it. I need to read through it. Um, this is a really fascinating book, this written images. This is out of print, unfortunately, so it might be hard to find. Uh, I put a price watch on a lot of these and wait for them to go down a reasonable amount because, like, if you look this up, it might be like 100 or 200 bucks. Wait for the price to come down. But this is really fascinating. Look at some, 
you know, like slips of paper and things like that. Like you can see this actual handwriting um, and some doodles and things like that. But we'll be going through some stuff like that. Um, I think Kierkegaard would have found it kind of hilarious that there's an international Kierkegaard commentary. <laughs> but like I have a few of these books that this actually helped me a lot with this first uh, early polemical works um, because we're so removed from Kierkegaard's time. And there's a lot of context that we're missing. And if you if you read through Kierkegaard, he's making a lot of allusions to, you know, existing literature and all, obviously the Bible and stuff like that. And like there's a lot of footnotes to get through and there's a lot of context in there. So the commentary actually helps put you back into that that place and time. Um, this is a fascinating book. I'm not super sure if we're going to go through it here, but Kierkegaard and Japanese thought some interesting parallels, um, some things that stand out as like very similar to Buddhism, especially. Uh, and then there might be some influence from this biography, which obviously you can see I have not made my way through it yet. I'm going very slowly, um, but uh, there's some good stuff in here. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is, video has gone on very long, but I, wanna, I, I did want to leave with an extended quote to show the motivation, like why is Kierkegaard relevant today? So I'm going to read this. This is on one of his trips when he was in northern Denmark. Uh, this is from August 1st, August 1st, 1835. The way I've actually, oh, let's try that again. The way I have tried to show matters in the preceding pages is how they actually seem to me. In now trying to come to an understanding with myself about my life, things look different. Just as a child takes time to learn to distinguish itself from objects and for quite a while so little distinguishes itself from its surroundings that keeping the stress on the passive side it says things like me hit the horse this same ph phenomenon repeats itself in a higher spiritual sphere therefore i thought i might possibly gain more peace of mind by taking up a new line of study directing my energies towards some other goal i might even have managed for a while in that way to banish a certain restlessness Though no doubt it would have occurred, it would have returned with greater effort, like a fever after the relief of a cool drink. What I really need is to be clear about what I am to do, not what I must know, except in the way knowledge must precede all action. Uh, it is a question of understanding my own destiny, of seeing what the deity really wants me to do. The thing is to find a truth which is true for me. The, to find the idea for which I am to be willing to live and die. And what use would it be in this respect if I were to discover a so-called objective truth, or if I worked my way through the philosopher's systems and were able to call them all to account on request, point out inconsistencies in every single circle? And what use would it be if in that respect to be able to work out a theory of the state and put all pieces from so many pieces into a whole, construct a world, um, which again, I myself did not inhabit, but merely held up for others to see. What use would it be to be able to propound the meaning of Christianity, to explain my separate facts as if it had no deeper meaning for myself and my life? And the better I became at it, and the more I saw others appropriate the offspring of my mind, the more distressing my situation would become, rather like that of parents who in their poverty have sent their children out into the world and turned them over to the care of others. What use would it be if truth were to stand there before me, cold and naked, not caring whether I acknowledged it or not, introducing an anxious shiver rather than trusting devotion? Certainly, I won't deny that I still accept an imperative of knowledge and that through it, uh, one can also influence people, but then it must be taken up alive in me. And this is what I uh, now see as the main point. This is, it is this my soul thirsts for as the African deserts thirst for water. That is what is lacking. And this is why I am like a man who has collected furniture and rented rooms, but still hasn't found the beloved uh, with whom to share life's good and bad fortune. But to find that idea, or more properly find myself, it is no use uh, of my plunging still further into the world. And that is exactly what I did before, which is what I had 
thought it would be a good idea to throw myself into jurisprudence uh, to be able to sharpen my mind on life's many complications. Here's a whole mass of details offered in, offering itself for me to lo lose myself in, but the given facts I could perhaps fashion a totality, an organism, or the life of thieves pursued into a darker aspect. That's why I could wish to become an actor so that I might be taken on another role. I could acquire a sort of surrogate for my own life and in those varying externals find some form of diversion. That's what I lacked for leading a completely human life and not just a life of knowledge, avoid basing my mind's development on yes, yes, something that people call objective, something at any rate isn't my own, and to base it instead on something which is bound up with the deepest roots of my existence, through which I have, as it were, grown into the divine, clinging so fast to it, even if the whole world were to fall apart. This, you see, is what I need, and this is what I strive for. So it is with joy and inner invigoration that I can com contemplate the great men who have found that precious stone for which they sell everything, even their lives, for which I see them intervening forces in life with firm step without wavering, going down their chosen paths, or run into them off the beaten track, self-absorbed and working in their, for their lofty goals. I even look with respect upon those false paths and lie there so close by. It is this inward action of the human, this God side of man that matters, not a mass of information. That, that is a, a fantastic summary, and that is early Kierkegaard writing in his journal, not even for publication, but it gives you a sense of what the heck that subjective truth actually means. Um, so that's what we're going to continue down. So, uh, <laughs> masses of books here. We're going to start with um, earlier polemical works, and we're going to go through in order. And hopefully, this will this video will be more than one. So um, I hope to see you next time, and uh, thank you for tuning in. All right, goodbye.